Thank you, Bina. Uh, the next, uh, my friend is Professor Sehun Kim from Korea. He will uh, talk about uh, complicated Kamal disease. Please, Professor Kim. I don't know. Probably he has not joined. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Sehun Kim from Korea University Medical Center, Seoul. Uh, my talk is regarding surgical treatment of complicated Kumer's disease and feasibility of single-stage transpedicular vertebral body reconstruction using expandable cages. This is my disclosure. Um, I was invited to Mumbai uh, three years ago for the Professor Ramani's 80 years young celebrations in um, May of 2018. I was so happy to be a part of that meeting. Let's talk about a typical case of complicated uh, cumulus disease on lumbar, uh, first lumbar. This patient, aged uh, 79, female patient, uh, she underwent the vertebroplasty at the lumbar one, uh, first lumbar, six months ago in the uh, other hospital. As you can see in this uh, initial x-ray, the L1 compression fracture is seen. But uh, after six months, the patient was presented to me uh, for the progressive back pain and left leg weakness of grade four and gait difficulty. This is the follow-up CT scan. Uh, compared with the previous initial CT scan, you can see the more collapsed vertebral body of L1. What would you do for this uh, specific patient? as an optimal treatment uh, with uh, the complicated cumulus disease patient uh, having the fracture progression, progressive kyphotic deformity, neurologic deficit, or intractable pain. Uh, let's talk about the osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. With the advent of aging society and development of radiological techniques, the osteoporotic uh, compression fractures has become more commonly diagnosed an increasing number of the patients show progressive kyphosis or delayed neurologic compromise uh, uh, without responding to the conservative treatment or MIS, the vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. The osteoporotic uh, vertebral compression fracture instance is uh, reported as uh, uh, having the non-union in 13.5%, and the incidence of the intravertebral cleft sign uh, as reported uh, in 7 to 13 patient uh, percentage in the patients with osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. This is the very typical uh, case of intravertebral cleft sign on your right hand MRI. So uh, in 1895, a German surgeon, Dr. Hermann Kummel, reported five patients with delayed post-traumatic vertebral collapse after asymptomatic uh, minimal spine uh, trauma. And uh, in 1911, one of his students, uh, Dr. Karl Schulz, assigned his uh, teacher's name to this kind of condition uh, disease. Uh, and about the same time with Kummel's uh, report, uh, a French surgeon, Bernoulli, uh, described a similar condition. So uh, sometimes uh, this kind of disease is known as cumul bernoulli disease. Uh, with the advent of X-ray, it was recognized that uh, kyphosis was the result of the delayed vertebral body collapse. Uh, the cumul disease, uh, also known as a post-traumatic delayed vertebral collapse, was defined as a vascular necrosis of vertebral body, occurring in a delayed fashion after minor trauma. So uh, in other words, intravertebral pseudoarthrosis, delayed post-traumatic vertebral osteonecrosis, fractured non-union, intravertebral cleft, uh, and finally ischemic vertebral collapses are uh, the same conditions. So uh, in summary, in Kumel disease, Osteonecrosis of the vertebral body develops in a delayed fashion after trauma to the spinal column and leads to vertebral body collapse and uh, finally progressive deformity and neurologic deficit. Uh, the number of the uh, cumulative disease is increasing and uh, usually demonstrates already progressive kyphosis due to the vertebral collapse 
at the time of diagnosis and causes intractable pain and sometimes neurologic deficit from the intravertebral instability. So uh, we can say the complicated cumulative disease are those patients having progressive kyphosis, intractable pain, and or uh, the delayed neurologic compromise. Uh, as indicated by the numerous uh, confusing uh, names for this kind of disease, uh, there has been uh, no known guidelines for the accurate pathogenesis, radiological diagnosis method, and the best treatment until now. So uh, this is the summarized clinical features of the Kumel's disease, uh, though uh, there are many controversies in the literature. Uh, first, asymptomatic period after initial minor trauma, then symptoms become gradually serious, and finally, intractable pain, vertebral body collapse, or neurologic compromise occurs in the last uh, phase. Um, more commonly, uh, the Kumel's disease is uh, observed in the women as the usual osteoporotic vertebral compre compression fracture occurs significantly higher in the women, although in some uh, other studies reported uh, the higher incidence in men among middle-aged agents. And the most common site of the fracture in Kumel disease is Suraculumbar junction. Uh, what about the pathogenesis of the Kumel disease? The representative hypothesis for the uh, Kumel disease is, uh, again, delayed healing or non-healing by osteonecrosis of the fractured vertebra. Uh, these are uh, some of the risk factors and possible pathogenesis of the Kumel disease, steroid, long-term use, osteoporosis, and so on. What about the radiologic features of the Kumel disease? Uh, most important radiologic finding is intravertebral cleft sign, so-called osteonecrosis. And it's sometimes observed in the uh, osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures as well, but it is not seen in the acute period. Uh, on the MRI, T1 weighted and fat suppressed T2 weighted image, image is the most useful diagnostic tools. So we can see low signal on T1 weighted image and high signal on T2 weighted image as you can see in this typical MRI. So the intravertebral cleft sign is an eventual finding that strongly suggests the presence of the uh, osteonecrosis. Uh, but it is not the pathognomic sign of Kumel disease. It is a specific sign of osteonecrosis in vertebral compression fractures uh, having the sensitivity of 85% and 99% of specificity and 91% of a positive predictive value in the literature. Now, let's talk about the general treatment of the Kumel disease. Actually, it is very difficult after progression of the disease. So, uh, when diagnosed, the vertebral kyphosis and intravertebral uh, instability have already been present with high degree of vertebral collapse requires more aggressive treatment, I think. So uh, the surgical treatment for the Kumel disease has various options according to the clinical and radiological status. This is well-known treatment for the Kumel disease, conservative treatment, and vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty as minimal invasive treatment, and what about the surgical treat treatment finally uh, for the more aggressive uh, the disease or sometimes the complicated Kumel disease. Uh, this is uh, many published papers regarding the MIS treatment for Kumel disease, but these are uh, m uh, mostly for the neurologically intact Kumel disease. Uh, we can do um, uh, many surgical options for the, uh, the thoracolumbar spine compression or burst fracture. As you can see in this slide, just putting pedicle screw fixation and vertebral body reconstruction using KG, zip plate or Canada uh, for the lateral uh, augmentation. And I'd like to introduce the expandable KG, as you can see on your right hand picture. And I'd like to mention the importance of the anterior support uh, and the vertebral body reconstruction for the uh, fracture patient. Uh, this patient first presented with L23 fracture dislocation. As you can see in the follow-up x-ray, 
a post of six months, it was good. But at a post of one year, we found uh, the fracture of the one uh, rod. And after one and a half year, we found bilateral rod fracture. So the anterior support is very important for the uh, fracture patient. This is my surgical procedure for the cumulative disease uh, having the complicated conditions. Uh, first, I'm putting the pedicle screw fixation, then single level vertebrectomy through the transpedicular route, and I'm putting the expandable KG through the uh, transpedicular route. Uh, I'm not sacrificing the nerve root, so there is no rhizotomy. So this is uh, how I do uh, the surgeries in step by step. Uh, this is part of my the uh, works published uh, four years ago at the clinical spine surgery. I published uh, the single stage transpedicular vertebrectomy and expandable cage placement for the unstable mid and lower uh, lumbar burst fractures. In this uh, the article, we were able to do uh, the vertebral body reconstruction using the single stage transpedicular route. This is a short video clip uh, for the unstable burst fracture, uh, the uh, vertebral body reconstruction. So uh, I'm pretty much using the uh, ultrasonic osteotome, as you can see here, and the high-speed drills. Let's move on to the uh, next slide because of time limit. So this is the immediate after inserting the KG and uh, expansion of the KG and compression of the upper and lower screws. So by this method, uh, I can uh, the reconstruct uh, vertebral body with smaller incision than the lateral approaches. Now, uh, let's go back to the first uh, demonstrable uh, the case of Kumel disease in female 79 year old patient. So, as I showed the follow-up CT scan and MRI, the patient has severe osteoporosis. So, what would you do for this specific patient? Just keeping conservative treatment, long segment posterior fusion, posterior decompression and long segment fusion, lateral decompression and lateral fusion, or other options? This is how I uh, did. I'm removing the uh, necrotized vertebral body using high-speed drill and ultrasonic osteotome, as you can see here. The ultrasonic osteotome is very safe and recommendable device I like to recommend. So I'm removing the bone fragment and as you can see, the white material in the uh, operating field. This is necrotized bone. And I'm removing the previously inserted PMMA, bone cement. Okay, as you can see here, I'm not sacrificing, I'm not cutting the nerve root bilateral. So this is a final post-operative x-ray and uh, the operative field and remove the uh, bone cement. And this is uh, post-op one month x-ray and CT scan, one year. So the patient showed stability with these uh, operations. What about this, uh, the T12 burst fracture patient? 71-year-old uh, female patient. She had Parkinson disease and ischemic spondylolisthesis at L5 and S1. It presented with progressive severe back pain and immobilization. Uh, she slipped down four months ago. And as you can see here, the MRI showed a typical Kummel disease and also a very severe osteoporosis on the bone density metry. So this is the initial x-ray uh, underwent the vertebral plast in our hospital three months ago. 
file of CT and MRI, as you can see here, the osteonecrosis developed. So again, what would you do? I did the same method. So, uh, so this is the final, uh, the uh, post-op post x-ray and operative field. A post of six months and two year actually uh, showed the stability using this method. Out of the 42 uh, bottle body reconstruction in the thoracolumbar burst fractures, we found 10 cases of cumul disease. So I did uh, the uh, four cases of the T12 cumul disease and six cases of L1 uh, bottle body uh, reconstructions. So without the rhizotomy, and uh, uh, I was able to reconstruct the vertebral body using the expandable cages. The operative uh, time averaged uh, 320 minutes and blood loss was uh, 500 milliliter. Five patients showed grade E normal and two patients grade two and three patients grade C in the Asia uh, scale. Uh, seven patients showed stability and the other three patients showed uh, the improvement postoperatively. Back pain, vascular, pretty much uh, improved after surgery. What about the average overall reduction of the deformity? It was, uh, from the, uh, it was reduced from the preoperative minus 25 degrees to immediate post-op uh, minus 15 degrees. And the mean loss of cup angle was very uh, minimal uh, between immediate post-op and last follow-up. Uh, there could be some uh, the possible complications in the bottle body reconstructions in this method. Uh, sometimes we can meet the dual tearing, cage subsidence, neural injuries, but uh, in my series, uh, over the uh, 42 uh, bottle body reconstructions, I found no complications or neurologic deterioration in the 10 uh, the Kumel disease patient. There are several advantages such as low mobility and comorbidity in posterior approach compared with the anterior approaches, having the complications of collateral injury to visceral or vascular organs. And surgeon's familiarity is another advantage. And uh, this single stage approach allows multi-segment fixation and correction of the deformity from behind and allows simultaneous surgery at the adjacent level in the same field. There, there could be some drawbacks, such as the uh, cage subsidence, possible implant failure, or too much aggressive, but I think uh, we can put good amount of additional bone chips surrounding the cages, and a lack of uh, fusion failure is uh, the, uh, one of the uh, good advantages of this method. So this is take home message. Um, for the very selected uh, cases of complicated Kumel disease, single-stage transpedicular bottle body reconstruction using expandable KG can provide low mobility of the standalone posterior approach and benefits of direct spinal corner decompression and bottle body reconstruction, as I showed here, without making the additional skin incision or sacrificing nerve roots. And this technique could be considered in a selected cases. As conclusion, a thorough systemic approach is required for the Kumel disease, and sometimes active aggressive surgical management uh, like my method would be uh, needed for overcoming the complicated Kumel disease with fracture progression uh, or progressive kyphotic uh, deformity, and finally neurologic deficit or intractable pain. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim.